now this is like when I was teaching. When I taught first grade, everyone got so quiet. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I am Ilham Askia. I am the executive director of Gideon's Promise, one of the sponsors for this evening's event. And I'm so delighted to see you all this evening for this great, great talk. Um, I am going to be introducing James Foreman. Um, but before I do that, I want to thank the Auburn Research Library, the Bataan Foundation, and our premium host, uh, the Southern Center for Human Rights. This is the last of their lecture series for the spring, and um, I look forward to seeing what's coming in the fall. So I want to get, oh yeah, let's clap for them, please. And I apologize in advance, I'm a little jet lag. I just got in from Central Time, so I have no idea what time, what my name really is, and where my children are at this time. <laughs> But let me tell you a little bit about tonight's um, presenter. So James Foreman, Jr. is the J. Skelly Wright Professor of Law at Yale Law School. He attended public schools, because that's what his parents truly believed in, in Detroit, New York City, and graduated here in Atlanta Public Schools. After attending Brown University and then later Yale Law School, he worked as a law clerk for Judge William Norris of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and later Justice Sandra Day O'Connor of the U.S. Supreme Court. After clerking, he joined the Public Defender Service in Washington, D.C., where for six years he represented both juveniles and adults charged with crimes. During his time as a public defender, James became frustrated with the lack of education and job training opportunities for his clients. So he decided on his public defender salary, which was very, 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 very low at that time, in 1997, along with David Domenici, to start the Maya Angelou Public Charter School, which was an alternative school for children who dropped out and for youth who had previously been arrested. A decade later, in 07, MAPCS expanded and agreed to run that school inside DC's juvenile system, juvenile prison. That school was an abysmal failure. But under the leadership of the Maya Angelou Public Charter School staff, um, it rose and became extraordinary according to the people who oversaw the juvenile system. Later, James continued in the Public Defender Service and then went to Georgetown Law School where he taught there. And now he is at Yale where he teaches constitutional law, a seminar called Race, Class, and Punishment, and a seminar called Inside Out, Issues in Criminal Justice, in which Yale Law students study alongside men who are incarcerated in a correctional facility in Connecticut. But his resume is great. Come on, he's a black man doing it for himself. <laughs> I want to talk about the personal side of James. I met James during his early years at the Maya Angelou Public Charter School when, he was, when I was dating one of his good buddies who worked at the Public Defender Office. I thought James and John were cool. They were all into the work that they did. They drank, they hung out, and that was great. And I thought James was pretty cool until he asked me one day to leave my very comfortable first grade class and come and teach at the Maya Angel Charter School, which were kids that were in high school. I said no. Second year, he asked. I said no. Third year, he asked. Hmm, I said after opening statements, witness testimonies, and some compelling arguments, James finally convinced me to teach at the school. And I did, and it was a phenomenal experience. I truly believe when you invest in children and put some extra love into those who come from challenging environments, it's amazing what can be produced, and James knew that. Who knew almost 20 years later, and I'm telling his age, not mine, <laughs> our professional paths would cross again in the criminal justice reform movement. James has been stating for years that the criminal justice reform movement is this generation's civil rights movement. And I steal that phrase every time I go and present and talk about my work. James is one of the few people who got it early on that in order to have true criminal justice reform, you must also include public defenders in the national conversation and they need to sit at the table. James has, de James has devoted his life to raising awareness about the root causes of our dysfunctional criminal justice system and what we can do to fix it. This evening, James is going to talk to you about his amazing book, which won New York Times 10 Best Books of 2017, Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. 
But he didn't stop there because he's so fabulous and I only hang out with fabulous people. <laughs> His book later in 2018 won the Pulitzer Prize. He's a Pulitzer. And when I learned of this on Facebook, I said, we won. We got a Pulitzer. <laughs> because when you are family, you claim everything when there's success. So without further ado, my dear friend, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you James Foreman, Jr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that kind introduction, Ilya. And I have to say that if you had told me no 10 times, I still would be asking you right now to come teach at Maya because you are such an exceptional teacher and she does such amazing work. Uh, I, I feel like tonight there's so many families that I'm a part of that are here. One is the family of, of public defenders uh, represented by folks from PDS as well as folks from, from Gideon's Promise. I'm going to talk about Gideon's a little bit later this evening. Illy's going to go have to pick up her son, so she's not going to hear it. But I just want all y'all to know who know her to go tell her afterwards that I said something good about her organization and the work that they do. But while she's here, uh, before she leaves, I will say that um, I didn't know how the organization was going to be able to survive and thrive. One of the real hallmarks of an organization's success is when the original person who started it leaves that leadership position. Um, and with Gideon's, what happened was uh, there were some big shoes to fill, John Robinson's big shoes, but then when I heard that Illy was going to take over as the executive director and, uh, and CEO, I don't know your exact title, but I know you're in charge, I knew that the organization was in good hands, and they're doing amazing work to try to change the culture of public defender's offices around the South and around the country, and so I just want to applaud you and everything you do before you have to leave. I also want to recognize the folks from Southern Center for Human Rights. I worked at the Southern Center when I graduated from law school. I went and spent a summer here uh, working back when it was called the Southern Prisoners Defense Committee. Uh, and same organization doing the same important work. Now, I wish I had proof that I worked there. It's on my, it's on my resume. But there's one problem, which is that the Southern Center has a hallway of pictures of all of the summer interns that have ever worked there. And if you go back to my summer, there's a missing space on the wall. And our picture has been taken, which I only have to think has, has been because somebody, not me, there must have been somebody else in that picture that somebody wanted to, 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 to grab onto that picture and hold that picture. Um, but, but I promise you I was there. I promise you we were there. And one day, one day I'm going to get the folks there to, to Find, uh, find and restore that picture. Um, I also want to thank uh, Roosevelt High School and the Atlanta Public Schools. Yay! Oh, you're here. So when I, my, first, my the original bio that they put up on the Yale website, it says like James Foreman went to Brown University, Yale Law School, and I went to them, and and I said, wait a minute, there's a problem here, which is that you didn't put the schools that I went to from kindergarten through 12th grade. You just have college and law school. And they said, well, our template doesn't allow for that. And I was like, well, you have to change your template. Because I would not have been at Brown and I would not have been at Yale without for the teachers and the Atlanta public schools and the Detroit public schools and the New York public schools, including my beloved teachers from Roosevelt High School. So I just want to thank all the public school teachers here and around the world. So I thought I would just spend a couple of minutes talking about my motivation for beginning this research and writing this book, which will help you also, I think, have a little bit of understanding of, of, where, I'm, of where I'm coming from and, and why I think these issues are so important. This is a, my book is a book about law and policy and history, but fundamentally it's a, it's a book of stories. Um, and one of the stories that I opened the book with is a young man that I represented by the name of Brandon. 
And Brandon was a teenage client of mine, Washington, D.C., 15 years old, had been charged with possession of a gun and possession of a small amount of marijuana. And I was his public defender. And I had taken the job of being a public defender because I viewed it, as Illy said, as a civil rights issue of my generation. See, my parents met in SNCC. They met in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And my dad is African American, my mom is white. They're an interracial couple at a, at a time when those marriages are illegal in many states in this country. And their generation changed and transformed this nation in ways that we're only beginning even really to process now 50 years later. Theirs was the generation that, that faced down Bull Connor's dogs, that marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that went to DC 250,000 strong for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Right, theirs was the generation that brought us the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Act of 68. I mean, Congress passed those laws, the president signed them, but we all in this room know that that only happened because people marched and people demanded and people protested. And they made it possible for somebody in my generation to have opportunities that were unimaginable in my father's generation. And yet and still, with all the changes that they had produced, when I was graduating from law school, I could see that there was unfinished business to the civil rights movement. I'm not saying this is the only area of unfinished business, but the unfinished business that I saw was in our criminal legal system. I used to call it, and in the book I call it the criminal justice system, but more and more, it's been harder for those words criminal justice to come out of my mouth because the system has so little justice, so now I more often call it the criminal legal system. And I could see when I was graduating from law school, I knew that we already knew. We didn't have the term mass incarceration then. That hadn't been created. But we already knew that one in three young black men was under criminal justice system, uh, under criminal justice supervision. We already knew at the time black women were the largest growing part of our prison system. We already, the United States passed Russia and South Africa in the late 1980s to earn the dishonor of being the world's largest jailer. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisoners starting in the early 1990s. And I had seen some of the changes in American society that would make all of this possible. I had seen it in my own life growing up. I grew up, the first house we lived in in Atlanta, if you go all the way down Boulevard, you get off I-20, go Boulevard South, you're going to dead end into a building. Okay, the building you're going to get into is the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. So when I was a kid, that was two blocks from our house. And two blocks in the other direction was another enormous building, General Motors plant. That's when I was a child. When I was graduating from law school and came back to Atlanta, one of those buildings had closed down, job shipped overseas. The other building had built an addition, an extra wing. And I don't need to know, I don't need to tell y'all which is which. So I wanted to fight that struggle. And that brought me to Superior Court Washington, D.C., standing next to Brandon, asking for probation. I had a letter, and a I had a letter from a teacher and a counselor at his school. They were asking for, for, for him to be put on probation. It was first arrest. They were testing to his character. His mother and grandmother were there in court. They had been there for every court hearing. They wanted him to come home. The prosecutor in the case, she wanted him to go to Oak Hill. Now, Oak Hill is like a lot of juvenile facilities in this country. It combines a very nice-sounding name oak tree on a hill, with a brutal and violent reality. It was a place where, where drugs and violence were rampant. It was a place where there were no functioning programs. It was a place where, as a child, you always left worse off than when you entered. The judge had to make the decision in the case, Judge Curtis Walker. And I changed his name. All the names of any of the, any of the people, don't laugh if you knew them. I changed all the names, but they're real people. So Judge Walker's African-American judge. That's not unusual. About 40% of the judges on the Superior Court bench in D.C. were African-American. So 
So Judge Walker looks out in the courtroom. He sees a young black man facing sentencing, black defense attorney, black prosecutor. And he looks at Brandon. He says, son, Mr. Foreman's been telling me that you've had a tough life. You deserve a second chance. Well, son, let me tell you about tough. Let me tell you about Jim Crow segregation. See, the judge had been a child in those years, so he lectured Brandon on what it was like. He said, so here's the thing, son. People fought, people marched, people died for your freedom. Dr. King died for you. And I tell you this, he didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on, embarrassing your family, embarrassing your community, carrying that gun. So I hope Mr. Foreman is right. I hope one day you turn it around. But today in this courtroom, actions have consequences. And your consequence is Oak Hill. Locked him up. I was so furious. I mean, think about it. The judge had just taken the same history that I told you motivated me to become a public defender, invoke the same decade, the same heroes, the same struggle in this twisted moral rationale for why it made sense to lock up another young African-American boy. And as I began to work through my anger, still in process on that, but <laughs> as I began to work through it, I began to think about the fact, you know, the judge wasn't alone in this respect. The city council that passed the gun and the drug laws that Brandon was being sentenced under, that was a majority black city council. The police chief in D.C., the police force was majority black. The police chief was black. The mayor was black. The chief prosecutor in the city was none other than Eric Holder. Before he was known nationally, he was the prosecutor in Washington, D.C. And even with all that representation in local government, and with some ability to pass the laws that were governing us and to affect the policing practices, what were we doing in this majority black jurisdiction? We were doing the same things that the rest of the country was doing. We were passing the same mandatory minimums, same stop and frisk, same terrible jail conditions, and with the same results. One in three young black men nationally under criminal justice supervision in D.C. at the time it was one in two. So I began to really try to wrestle with the question of what happened in this country that was so powerful, so profound, so overwhelming, so all-encompassing, that even in this majority black community, we would make some of those same policy choices and achieve some of those same results. How did that come to be? Now, I'm not going to have a chance to give you a full answer to that question today, but the good news is there's a book outside. <laughs> And I'll be signing afterward. But I'll give you the highlight, a couple main key points. And the first thing that I think we have to understand is rising crime and violence and the fear and the anger that it generated in black communities throughout the last 50 years, especially in the crack years of the 80s, early 90s, and the heroin years of the 1960s. Most people know a little bit about the crack in the 80s and the 90s. Let me say something about the 60s. The homicide rate in this country doubled in the 1960s. It more than doubled in Atlanta. It tripled in Washington, D.C. Heroin, they tested everybody entering the D.C. jail for substances every year. In 1964, they found that 4% of the people entering the D.C. jail were heroin addicts. By 1969, the 4% had become 45%. and the response that it generated in the community. I was able to write this book only because of research libraries like this one and many others, particularly in the DC area where many elected officials had deposited their, all their papers. And luckily for me as a, as a researcher, a number of these people deposited everything, not just their public pronouncements, but the letters they received from constituents. So it's this amazing, Social history of a city in, in transition and city in crisis. So remember, this is a majority black city. D.C. is 70% African American in the 1970s. It's called a chocolate city. 
So these are mostly black officials writing to a mostly, uh, mostly black citizens writing to mostly black elected officials. 11 out of 13 members of the first city council in DC were African American. And these letters reveal a kind of pain and suffering. People say, I don't know what happened. We just fought the civil rights movement, and I'm, a, I'm scared to take my kid to school. I feel like a prisoner in my own home. I feel like a stranger on my own streets. And these letters always end with some version of do something, do something. You got to do something about it. Now, who's, who's receiving these letters? Right? That's the second big argument in the book. The generation of people that is receiving these letters is the first generation of black elected officials to be elected in any number in this country since Reconstruction. And it's because of the Voting Rights Act. We have an 800% increase in the 1970s and 1980s of African American elected officials. Now it's 800% increase over almost zero, but it's an 800% increase. What do we know about these folks? A bunch of them were in the Civil Rights Movement. Many of them are from the South. All of them remember, whether they're living in the South at the moment or not, they're from the South. And all of them remember the long history of under-enforcement and under-protection of the law that has been part of the black experience in this country since slavery. Right? They remember. I mean, my dad used to tell me about this. He grew up in Jim Crow, Mississippi, Jim Crow South Side of Chicago. He said, we didn't call the police in our neighborhood, black community, we didn't call the police under Jim Crow. The police weren't going to come for a black victim. And if they came, the only thing we could be sure of is they were going to make matters worse. They remembered Southern sheriffs in cahoots with the Klan asked about a homicide in a black neighborhood. They said, oh, that's not a homicide. That's another dead black person. And they didn't use the words black person. So they know this history, right? They're shaped by it. Now they're in office. And with whatever amount of control and power they have, they're going to try to make the law enforcement apparatus respond to those citizens, those citizens that wouldn't have bothered to write their representatives under Jim Crow, but now are with black elected officials in office. They want a response, and at least some of these officials want to provide it. OK, so crime is rising. People are scared. They're petitioning government, and there's some who want to respond. But why is it police and prosecutors and prisons? Why is that the response? that almost exclusively the community gets. And here we get to the other piece of the story, which is my research and my writing is mostly about black citizens and black officials and majority black cities and the choices and the arguments and the debates and the intellectual and political and cultural and social history of African Americans. That is what I am most interested in. But, any book that's going to be about what black people say and think and do and want is also going to be a book about the larger society that limits and constrains the choices that is available to the black community and its elected officials. So let me mention a couple of those constraints. The first one is historical. The black elected officials who I write about have been elected to represent communities that because of a history of racism and white supremacy, starting in slavery, which we should remember, we never talk about this enough, we had slavery in this country for longer than we haven't. And I'm not talking about metaphorical. I'm talking about actual 1619 to 1865 is more years than 1865 to the present. That then, what is that followed by? That is followed by Jim Crow, segregation, white supremacy in law, right? official policy of cities and states to deprive black communities and black citizens of resources. And this is very specific. This means that if you're a black soldier and you come back from World War II, you don't get access to the GI Bill, those benefits that you're supposed to get for serving your country. You're denied because of your race. This means that if you're a black homeowner and you want to get a loan to try to improve your house, if you want to get a loan to buy a house, you are not 
given access to capital. So black communities over time are made poorer, while white communities are made wealthier. This means, very concrete, this means that when the government makes decisions about where it's going to build the federal highways, where does it put them? Well, we are standing on what was once called the Black Wall Street. Thriving black middle class neighborhood. Dr. King was raised here. Federal Highway, I-75, I-85, put right smack down through the middle of this community, devastating it for a decade, still trying to recover. So what this means is that because of this accumulated decades, centuries, of social policy, specific social policy, it means that when black elected officials come into office, they have been elected to protect and represent neighborhoods that lack the resources to protect themselves, so they're over-reliant on the state. They're over-reliant on police and prosecutors for that protection. The second constraint I want to just identify is a political one. So my research is mostly about cities and local government, because that's where black political power has been concentrated in this country. City councils, county councils, chief and mayor's office. And one of my arguments is that city governments have had more to say about creating mass incarceration and have more to say today about how to dismantle it than we, than we have given them credit for. But there are also limits to what local officials can do. And you see this in the book over and over again. Black elected officials had what I call an all of the above strategy for fighting crime and violence. They wanted more police and more prosecutors, and sometimes, unfortunately, even more prison. But they also wanted more money for housing, more money for schools, more money for jobs, more money for mental health care, more money for after school programs. They wanted national gun control to go along with the local gun control laws they were passing. They wanted a Marshall Plan for urban America. They wanted the United States government to do for cities what it did for Europe after World War II, to reinvest, to rebuild, to revitalize. Well, for 50 years, black elected officials have been going to Congress asking for money for all of the above. And for 50 years, they've been coming back from Congress and from state houses with money for one of the above, law enforcement, police, and prosecutors. The last constraint that I want to mention, and I am with this one because it's a, strength, a constraint that I think we still suffer from to this day, and we have to work collective, collectively to liberate ourselves from. But this is a generation of people. My research in the 70s, 80s, 90s is about a generation of people constrained by their imaginations in terms of how to respond to what were real, pressing, genuine social policies. So let me give you, there's so many examples of it. And from your reaction, I know y'all probably have a bunch more examples yourselves. <laughs> but let me just give you one. One of the people I write about is a guy named David Clark. Now, David Clark, I told y'all that 11 out of 13 members of the first city council in D.C. were African American. David Clark is one of the two white members. He has an unusual biography. He went to Howard Law School in the 1960s. He graduates, for, works for Martin Luther King, becomes a lawyer for poor people, and gets elected to city council in 1975. Now, for these purposes, what you should know about David Clark is he is not a drug warrior. In fact, he's the opposite. The first piece of legislation that he proposes when he gets into office in 1975 is marijuana decriminalization. It doesn't pass, mostly because of some... some uh, uh, black pastors, but we, we, that's, a, that's the topic of chapter one of the book. It doesn't pass. It doesn't pass. We could talk about that. They've, they've come around since then. At least in D.C. they have. I don't know about down here. But, they were, but David Clark is not a drug warrior. All right. Now, it's the early 1980s, and I told you about heroin in the 60s, early 80s. It's back in force. 
And again, you see an uptick in urgency and passion in these letters to the elected officials. And this time, it's all about heroin addicts. And people are saying, and I don't endorse this language, but it's the language of the letters. People are saying, you know, there's these junkies, and they're gathered on our stoops and on, in the alleys, and they're leaving dirty syringes, and they're nodding off on the park benches, and I'm afraid to take my kid to the park. And again, over and over again, they're saying some version of do something about it. So David Clark gets all these letters, and he forwards them to the head of the relevant government agency. And each time he gets a letter back saying, Council Member Clark, we received your citizen complaint. We're on the case. Now, here's the question. Who did he forward the letters to? Remember, remember, the letters are about addicts, addicts in public space. So does he forward in the Department of Mental, Mental Health? Social work, public health, addiction services, treatment. Police chief. Because even though he's not a drug warrior, right, he's an American, and like so many people, his imagination has been so constrained that he can only think of the problem of addicts in public space as one that you send somebody whose only tool is handcuffs and a gun, and only place they can take you for treatment where there is none is the local jail. And so one of my arguments is that if we're to understand how we got the world's largest prison system, it is important that we look at statements of presidents and acts of Congress. But it's also essential that we look at the tiny decisions hidden many of them obscure. Some of those decisions made by well-intentioned people. Not all of them, Jeff Sessions, but some of them made by well-intentioned people. Decisions like, when I'm an elected official and I get letters about, from citizens about addicts in public space, which government agency do I enlist for support? Do I write the police chief? or somebody else. And it's those small decisions, I argue, that are the individual bricks that collectively have built the prison nation that the United States has become. Now, I know there's a lot of folks that, in the, if you came to this talk, you, you care about this issue already. And I know that when I always go to these, when I always go to lectures, I and mean, especially when I was a student, but even you know, today I go to lecture and I hear somebody talk about the issue that they're passionate about, of great social urgency. And then when they finish describing this problem in terrible detail, they say, OK, I'm done, and they walk off the stage. And I'm always left depressed and despondent because they haven't said anything about what we can do about this problem. And so I promise myself and I promise you that I'm not going to be that person. So before we get to, uh, to Q&A and book signing, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about some thoughts about you know, how, how do we respond? How, how do we think about responding? And there's, there are so many, right, there are so many pieces that I could talk about, and there's people in this room that are working on, you know, reimagining the justice system, and there's people that are working on conditions of confinement to make our prisons and our jails less abusive, and there are people that are working on ending cash bail, and there are people that are working on reinvigorating public defender offices and so many, other, so many other pieces of this problem. And I can't say that any one of these things is more important than any other. What I think I could do to be useful is just to try to reflect on a few different ways of, of, of thinking about the problem, thinking about responding to enormous historical injustices. And I guess the first point that I want to make is, is based on uh, a lesson that I learned um, from my mother. 
And it's this idea of refusing to give away your power. Refusing to give away the power that you have as an individual. And she reinforced this in lots of ways uh, throughout my childhood, but, but one example of it was I had recently started at Roosevelt High School, in fact. And I was in my 10th grade year, and I had only been in the school for a couple days. And I saw something in the bathroom. I walked in the bathroom, and I didn't even know my lay of the land of the school, so I didn't necessarily know which the, ba- the you know, the, 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 the best bathrooms to use, you know, all the kind of things you learn over sc- in school, like where to go when. But I walked in this bathroom, and I saw what I now understand, and what I understood at the time was bullying. And it was some, a group, it wasn't physical, but it was a group of kids, and they were making fun of another kid. And I don't know that I had the words for it then, but it was about this uh, young person's sexual identity and their sexual expression and how they dressed and walked and carried themselves. And I didn't know exactly what was happening, but I knew it was wrong, and I knew that it made me sick. And I went home that night, and I was talking to my mom. And I told her what happened. And I had ideas for what the principal could do. I had ideas for what the assistant principal could do. I had ideas for what my mom could do. My mom was one of these moms that was like always up in the school about this, that, and the other thing. (laughs) And mostly when I didn't want her to be there. And I was like, this is actually something that would be useful for you to be working on. And, you know, she listened to me very carefully. And she said, I'm glad that you're open and honest and willing to talk to me. But she said, I just have one question for you. And I suspect y'all know where I'm going with this. <laughs> she looked at me and she said, James, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Because by having ideas for everybody else, but not having the ideas for yourself, you're giving away your power. You're giving away your power. And there are, I think, so many small ways in which We sometimes have more power than we think. Let me just give you one, I think seemingly in some ways maybe mundane, but I actually think quite quite important um, uh, and potentially revolutionary, uh, but certainly, certainly important and certainly political. And this is this idea of jury service. I cannot get over the number of people I talk to, starting from when I worked as a public defender and they would come in on voir dire, to this day, to a week ago, I was talking to somebody about the system, the legal system, and how unfair it was. And so many people that I encounter as a lawyer both think that the system is unfair and don't want to serve on juries will do everything they can to avoid jury service, get the notice, put it at the bottom, then call it. If they do call, don't show up or call in and get as many deferments as they can get, or show up and say, I can't serve, I can't be fair. I'm like, look, (laughs) seriously, if you think that mass incarceration is a problem, if you think that our system is unfair, and you take yourself out of jury service, What you are doing is you are leaving our juries to be full of people who are good with mass incarceration. And the only thing that they're going to do is keep it going. So what I want to say to people is is it is a seemingly small thing, but it is an essential thing. You have to go. I'm the first. I get my, I'm like, I'm early. I mean, I never get chosen, but I'm early. I'm ready. I'm like, you have to use a peremptory on me. I'm coming. So please do it, and you know, because we talk about voting, we have all these conversations about voting, right, and the importance of voting, but we don't have as many similar conversations about the importance of jury service, and when in Reconstruction, when African Americans fought for the right for political enfranchisement, they understood, and the women's women's rights movement was the same, they understood Political participation as existing in two spaces, the ballot box 
and the jury box. And we have to reclaim some of that in our own practice and not give away our power by avoiding service. I, I want to talk about another idea that I've been thinking a lot about. And it's this notion, okay, so you're going to claim your power, but then let's think about you know, what you're going to do with it. And for me lately, I've been thinking a lot about this importance of, of building community and building relationships and building bonds across boundaries and building relationships and being in community especially with those communities that have been most affected by and most disenfranchised by mass incarceration. And so the place that that's taking me in my own life is inside prison. So you heard Illy talk earlier about this, but I just want to mention, you know, I was going giving these talks for a couple years talking to people about, well, here's what you can do, and a long list of agenda items for how we could push back against mass incarceration. And I really started to ask myself the question of, well, what, what am I doing? You know, what more can I do? And, I'm fun, and, and I really do believe that most of what we can do, we have to figure out a way to do in connection with the rest of our daily lives. We can do extra things. We can go outside. But as much as we can incorporate the work, the justice work, into the regular fabric of our life, it's going ma to make us more effective and it's going to make it more sustainable. And so for me, that means, well, I'm a teacher, right? I'm a law teacher. And I'm lucky to teach some of the most wonderful law students in the country. Some of them are here in the audience. In fact, one of them, Aaron Littman, who's here, was one of my very first research assistants. I came with this idea. I was like, I want to write a book about African-American politicians and and what they did over the last 50 years. And I had just arrived at the law school. Nobody knew me. Nobody heard of me. It was a crazy idea. And Aaron Littman signed up. So thank you, Aaron. And you know, check the acknowledgments. He's in there. And so I'm a teacher. And I think about the fact that over the last 30 or 40 years, we have ripped education out of prisons and jails in this country. One of the things, one of the worst features that, I mean, I would say one, one terrible feature of the 94 crime bill that doesn't get discussed enough because there are so many more terrible things that draw people's attention was the provision that eliminated Pell Grants from prisons around this country. And that meant that community colleges could no longer get reimbursed, so they couldn't afford to send people in. So we saw a dramatic reduction in prison education. And it's not like we had much prison education before that. So I thought, OK, well, what can I do about this? So I now teach in a program called Inside Out Prison Exchange. And if anybody is interested in it, go check out the website. Don't do it now. But later, go Inside Out Prison Exchange. And what it does is it tra trains professors to teach the class that you normally teach at your home university, but you teach it inside of a prison or a jail. So what this means is that I teach a class on the basically the sociology of the criminal justice or now criminal legal system. I had to change the syllabus. 10 students from Yale, 10 students who are incarcerated. And it's the 13 weeks we meet as peers, as equals, in a seminar setting. One of my students from that class, Natalie, is here. Go, go find her afterwards, and you can talk to her about it. And if you didn't like it, lie and tell them that you did. <laughs> it's incredibly powerful because it puts people in relationship who the system is designed to separate and to segregate. And one of the reasons why mass incarceration has been, able, has been sustained in the way that it has is because of these barriers and because of this othering that our prison system reinforces. And a program like Inside Out, it undermines that by changing the nature of those relationships. For my Yale students, I think it's so powerful because they're otherwise studying this material in, in books, and they're learning about the, the system, but they're not hearing the real voices of people who are directly affected. They're reading about the system through the voices of federal judges. 
who, no offense, there are some wonderful ones. No offense to any who may be present. But, but, are not being directly affected by the system in that way. And for my incarcerated students, right, it's so transformative and it, so liberating. One of them wrote at the end of, a couple semesters ago, he wrote at the end of the semester, he said, look, I like the law and the policy. This was in the final evaluation. I like the law and the policy that we learn in this class. But most of all, he said, I like the fact that for two hours a week, when I came into the seminar circle, I was entering a place where I was treated like I had ideas. I was treated like I was smart. I was treated like, and on some days I even felt like an intellectual. And that experience created a freedom and an armor for me that I could then carry with me through the rest of the week when I got into this prison in this system that was designed to have me think of myself not even as human. So that's what it looks like, I think, to build relationships in places where the system is designed to, to crush them. I'm going to say just two more of the things. One thing that I want to talk about that's connected to what I just said about building relationships across these these barriers and across these boundaries, but it goes further than that, is thinking about lifting up the voices into leadership positions of people who have been incarcerated, who have been in the criminal legal system, and of their families, and thinking about what we can do to promote those perspectives and those voices, because what's happened over the last 40 or 50 years is those voices have been stigmatized and have been ridiculed and been excluded. At the public defender's office back in the 90s, we would be going and testifying about reform issues, and I would say to the, the supervisors in the office, why aren't we sending our clients and their families to go testify? And they, the answer that I got back was, our clients and their families are so stigmatized that if they're the ones raising the issue, they won't have any credibility with the legislators. And I could see where people coming from to a point, but of course our position then reinforce and further that stigmatization because if you never hear from people who are directly affected, then the first time somebody shows up, yeah, you're not going to be prepared to listen, but if you can make that a regular part of the advocacy process, and I don't think she's here right now, but I want y'all to look out. Is Serena Nunn here? She is. Okay. Serena, stand up so people can see you, because they need to come find you afterwards. Okay, so, all right, you can see, I'm not going to make you stand for the whole time. <laughs> I just want people to see you. So... Serena is one of the individuals that I mentioned who I've known for quite some time, was first had her sentence commuted by President Clinton before she was ultimately then subsequently pardoned by President Obama. And and she is getting ready to put together what I think is going to be a very powerful national project that is going to try to make it easier in all 50 states, not just at the federal level where there's been a lot of attention, but at the state level, is going to really try to bring fairness and transparency to the pardon and the commutation process all over the country. So she, she said, listen, if you're going to talk about me, just know that I, have it. I don't have everything organized yet. I don't have the website together. So don't have people bombard me and expect that they're going to get like an answer tomorrow. But what I want to say is that if you're interested in that issue, I hope that you will go. Uh, Serena, what's the website? Go to serenanunga.com, give your information there, and then as soon as she has the project really launched, um, she'll be in touch. But I think that it is so important, and she's such a powerful and potentially trans transformative advocate in this space because she has experienced directly the thing that she's advocating for. And so I hope that those of you all that are involved in the justice reform movement in some way in this city 
um, will seek her out. Last thing that I'm going to say, and this principle, along with some of the others that I talked about, right, not giving away your power and building relationships with, uh, with commu across uh, barriers, barriers and boundaries and lifting up the voices of those that have been the most directly affected. This last principle um, that I really carry forward with me in my work um, is one that my dad used to always talk about, and is this idea of remaining hopeful even when it feels like you're outnumbered and even when it seems like the conditions don't call for it. And he used to talk about this in lots of ways, but one example of how he talked about it was a couple years before he passed away, we were watching a movie about the Civil Rights Movement. And the movie was over, and I asked him, well, what did you think of it? You know, you were there. And he said, well, I like the movie. He said, I liked it because they put this history on screen, and more people watch movies than read books, which I have found out is true. <laughs> but he said, this is what I didn't like. He said, what I didn't like is they made it seem like everybody was in the movie. It wasn't like that. He said, I used to go to college campuses to try to recruit people to come join the movement. And the university administrators would run all the SNCC workers off campus. They didn't want us coming and taking kids to go down to Mississippi. And now those same universities all have these big displays <laughs> of all their students that went down to South to fight in the Civil Rights Movement. He said, you know, Martin Luther King was unpopular when he died. True, Two-thirds unfavorable. Gallup did a poll. Two-thirds unfavorable. The march on Washington was unpopular when it happened. The march on, I mean, it, so the, today all we have is Dr. Black History Month is like Dr. King at the march on Washington. So the march on Washington. The question in the poll was, do you think the planned march in Washington on behalf of the Negro will help or hurt the cause of the Negro? And 60% said they thought it would hurt. My dad said, look, you know, there are 250,000 people at the march on Washington, and that's a big number. But a decade later, 10 million people would say they were there. <laughs> so this, my dad said, look, he, was, he, he said, look, man, he would always call me, look, man, I'm not telling you this because I want credit for being there first. That is not my point. He said, I'm telling you this because the way they tell this history is demoralizing to your generation. Because you work on your issue, and you call a meeting, and six people come to the meeting, and five of them were at the last meeting. <laughs> and then you go see everybody marching, and you think, well, what's wrong with my issue? So what my dad was telling me, and what I'll say to you, is that if you ignore the people that tell you that change is impossible, and if you keep mobilizing and petitioning, and marching, and litigating. You're going to come up with an idea to challenge mass incarceration. The same way previous generations came up with strategies for dismantling Jim Crow and slavery. And when you do, they're going to make a movie about you. <laughs> and when it comes out, I'll be in the front row with Christian Lamar, Judge Totenberg, Jack White. We'll be in the front row, popcorn in hand, cheering you on. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.